the false light of Abdru Shin, using the light of God's word to reprove the darkness of Oscar E. Bernhardt and the Grail Message Foundation by Scroll Independent Ministries. So the intention for this series is to reach out to those who are involved in this sect, to bring them to the truth of God's preserved word, the Holy Bible, which is the King James Version for the English-speaking peoples. This is also to approve the, the teachings of the Grail Message Foundation and Abru Shin. And this is to provide additional information to those who may need to know about this organization in the context of the Bible and how to respond to it. Here, let's just read a couple of Bible passages um, in relation to uh, this this group and uh, the teachings that it has against the Bible. Um, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4 says, uh, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Galatians 1 verses 8 to 9 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Ephesians 5 verses 11 to 13 says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Let's get started with our historical background on the Grail Message Foundation and Abrusion. So, what is the Grail Message Foundation? Founded based on the teachings of Oscar E. Bernhardt, a.k.a. Abdur Shin, in the early 20th century in Germany, this sect is primarily based on his writings, as most popularly demonstrated in In the Light of Truth, which is available in 26 languages. Today, the Grail Message Foundation has a reported 10 to 40,000 followers in its organization, mainly stemming in Germany, France, Britain, Canada, Brazil, and Nigeria. Some members partake in a sealing ritual, which is an oath devoting oneself to the society, although it is debatable how strict the oath is. With that being said, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. It says, And again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever more than these cometh of evil. Now with that being said, um, as this organization does require uh, sealing, um, which is the taking of an oath, you can see where this may lead to, according to the words of Jesus. Our answers are supposed to be yes and no. So whatever is coming more of this is not good. So let's continue looking into this organization and other organizations that very well may have influenced the Grail Message Foundation. The Early Life and Career of Oscar E. Bernhardt He was born on April 18, 1975, was raised in a small Saxon town called Bischof Swerda, which hopefully I pronounced right. 
Although he trained in business, he started pursuing writing and published short stories and novels. His mother-in-law of his first marriage had accused him of fraud, and he had even been in prison for 13 months after being similarly accused by previous business partners. Off to a bad start. He was arrested in 1915 to 1919 after living in Britain as a German national during World War I. He found out after being in the internment camp that his mother had died in 1917, and his son was killed in the War of 1918. Some people have traced this as uh, the start of his writings for the Grail message, um, just to take that into consideration. The Origins of Abdru Shin and His Following The first location was in Bad Hilbrun Hilbrun in 1925, where he had religious ceremonies, but eventually that assembly had broken up. In 1928, he started a residence in Vomperburg, Tyrol, Austria, where he wrote In the Light of Truth and other works. Here is where Bernhardt saw most of his growth. Bernhardt from henceforth would go by the pen name Abdru Shin, which means servant of light, which is interesting to consider in consideration to 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 to 14, where it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of darkness. No, that's not what it says. It says an angel of light. So if he's calling himself a servant of the light, and his words are not in accordance to what the Bible says, then one has to take this passage into consideration. What did he teach? The teachings of Bernhardt are considered to be inspired by Western esotericism and German neo-romanticism. His beliefs were also inspired by Ariosophy, which is essentially the belief in Aryan ethno-superiority, which was obviously growing during this time, giving rise to the Nazis. German Paganism and Heretical Christianity he taught the eminent coming of the Last Judgment, i.e. Great Tribulation as known in popular circles, but is more correctly known as the time of Jacob's trouble, and that he was the Son of Man, and the mediator between God and men, even comparing himself to Jesus. However, when we turn to the Bible again, we turn to Galatians 3 verse 20, it says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And if we turn to 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So God is a mediator of one, and Jesus is that mediator. Um, Second uh, Timothy or First Timothy uh, three sixteen says, "Behold, great is uh, the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh." And Col- Colossians two verse nine says, "For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily." So he's Abdurushin is trying to put himself in the place of Christ. We'll continue uh, looking into this further. He essentially demonstrated that, although his teachings were to be revolutionary and a great revelation for mankind, his teachings were pretty mediocre to say the least, as seen here in the statement below uh, and also demonstrated in future slides. So he wrote in the light of the truth, For there is nothing new to be created. In everything, it is merely a matter of producing new forms, since all the elements already exist in the vast creation. So, the Bible does not say that we're going to be receiving more revelations going forward. It 
basically closes saying, do not add and take away from the scripture. Um, so, you know, Abdur Shin shows up and starts giving new doctrine, but he doesn't even admit that it's anything new. And if we look into it further, it really isn't new um, and can even get traced back to the Garden of Eden. Um, but let's continue. Among his philosophies were a great reliance on intuition, detachment from material wealth, and inner mystic exploration. Ironically, and arguably hypocritical, depending on how you want to look at it, Bernhardt claimed that he was not trying to start a new religion. And here's a quote from his book. It says, The following word does not bring a new religion but it is intended as the torch to help all serious listeners or readers find the right path, which leads them to the lawn for height. I'm going to say something here. Um, if you notice uh, in that s statement below, um, the word word is uppercased. In the Bible, that's supposed to represent Jesus, but here he's using it for a reference to his teachings. Um, that's not a good sign. Um, that's confusion, and uh, that's not what the what we're supposed to be looking at. Um, that's supposed to be the title of God. Um, also, if we turn to 1 John 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So here we can also see that, yes, it is important for people to question what is being said. And with Abdur Shin saying, um, but is intended as the torch of all serious listeners or readers to find the right path, he's essentially saying there, let your guard down. Um... We're allowed to ask questions, and we're allowed to, to be skeptical. And if he is leading people down the wrong path, then we should be allowed to s expose this man for what he is teaching. So, let's move to the next point. So, Abdurushin also claimed to be the Messiah, um, as found uh, here in this quote um, in his book. It says, Abdurushin has now completed his message to mankind. In him has arisen Emmanuel, right? In him being Abdurushin, the envoy of God, the son of man, right? So he's, he's calling himself the son of man, who's coming to judge and to save those who have not cut themselves adrift from salvation, was foretold by Jesus, the son of God, in corroboration of the prophecies of the prophets of old. Chapter and verse, please. Um, actually, I'm going to be providing a couple verses of Jesus foretelling of Abdurushin, um, as demonstrated below. Um, let me continue reading the rest of his passage, uh, or his, his words. He says, uh, He carries the insignias of his high office, the living cross of the truth radiating from him, and the divine dove above him. The same insignias as were born by the Son of God. Awaken, O man, for your spirit is asleep. So this guy had a bit of an ego. Um, but when we turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. If we turn to... The, the same chapter is, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive very gullible people. No, it says they shall deceive the very elect. That is to show how much discernment we should be having, especially in these times as we reach the end of the world. Um, Abdur Shin is claiming to be Jesus, and Jesus isn't supposed to return until essentially after the Great Tribulation, or the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, Great Tribulation is not a term 
uh, to be used for uh, the seven years, um, Daniel's 70th week. Um, so Abrushin is, is exposing himself to be a false prophet um, in relation to these verses. Um, here we're going to take a, look, a brief look at some of the cults uh, that were starting uh, during the same time as Abrushin and kind of notice some similar patterns uh, with, with all of these men. Um, just revealing that Abrushkin was not as creative as some people would like uh, him to, to believe. It says, um, here's a, from uh, the Wikipedia page on a man named G uh, Gudo von List. Gudo Karl Anton List, better known as Gudo von List, was an Austrian occultist, journalist, playwright, and novelist. Does he sound like anybody you know? He expounded a modern pagan new religious movement known as wantonism, which he claimed was the revival of the religion of the ancient German race, and, and which included an inner set of ariosophical teachings that he termed Arminianism. He was born and raised into a Roman Catholic family with, yeah, in vain, right? So one thing also to consider um, as we go through this series and really throughout history is most of these types of guys will have Catholic connections. Um, and when we also consider things like Freemasonry, uh, and being influenced by the Jesuits, um, that's that's also another uh, thing to consider. And obviously, the Jesuits are the uh, military branch of uh, the Catholic Church. Um, you have uh, the White Pope, and you have the Black Pope. Um, this is this is pretty serious stuff. Um, um, he became infatuated with occultism and theosophy through Volkish philosophy. German ethno-nationalism and Aryan superiority. He believed in the ancient pagan god Wotan, a.k.a. Odin. And he taught millenarianism and a coming new age, all the while attesting to the wickedness of modern society. It's also something to consider that he would use Christian terminology um, to try to lead more people into his beliefs. But uh, one thing to consider also is this coming new age, right? This is this kind of like age of Aquarius, um, this uh, this utopia, and already that's that's something that we can see with Abru Shin. But he was not the only person uh, promoting uh, these types of beliefs. Um, we also have here Lons Lanebefels. Excuse my pronunciation. So, here's another thing from the Wikipedia. Um, it says, Adolf Joseph Lanz, also known under his pseudonym as fascist agitator Georg Lanz von Liebenfels, was an Aust Austrian political and racial theorist and occultist who was a pioneer of Ariasophy. He also was a former monk and the founder of the magazine Ostra, in which he published anti-Semitic and Volkish theories. When he was a boy, he had a great interest with the Holy Grail, as also the Nazis did, as also the people that ended up naming the organization that Abru Shin was involved with. I mean, you don't just go and name your organization, you know, the Grail Foundation, and not have some sort of an interest in that. But uh, his teachings consisted of occultism, Aryan racial supremacy, a new golden age of man, that's the third one, and Gnosticism. He was also highly inspired by Freemasonry, as seen with his order called Hoher Arminen Orden, High Arminen Order. Um, one thing actually to point out here, 
that is actually a Masonic gesture. It's called the uh, Master, Master of the Second Veil, or the Hidden Veil. And uh, you can find plenty of uh, Masons um, using that same uh, type of gesture. And here's our uh, our guy here um, involved with this. There's plenty of uh, Masonic symbols that we'll also be exploring in this uh, in this video as well, because uh, unfortunately Abdur Shin uh, had uh, had been using those types of sy symbols as well. Um, Lons also founded the Order of the New Templars in the 1900s. Um, just a little brief history of the Templars. Uh, the Templars were disband they were a knighthood um, from the Catholic Church, which was disbanded um, because they were more or less uh, found to be worshipping Baphomet. Um, the Freemasons claim to have an origin from uh, the Templars. Um, actually, their 32nd degree is, uh, is attributed to the Templars. So, back to Abdur Shin, let's look at the disbandment of the society and the end of his life. So in 1936, Bernhardt was arrested for three months under the accusations of infractions to currency laws through transferring funds from Germany to Austria. This caused distrust among his followers. Remember earlier in his life where he was having issues with his business partners and even his ex-wife's mother-in-law? Um... He seemed to, I guess old, old habits don't die, you know, easy. Um, he, he continued that uh, even while he was running his new religion, which he said he wasn't doing, but, you know, Satan's the father of lies. Um, the assembly fell apart in 1938, shortly after Nazi Germany had invaded Austria, where Bernhardt was placed under house arrest again in Innsbruck, where he would be brought to Schlotheroth, excuse my pronunciation, due to political connections. Towards the end of Bernhard's life, those closest to him saw that he was disappointed that his prophecies about the end of the world did not come into fulfillment. Which is interesting. Because 2 Timothy 3 verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I wonder if they're being deceived by even the, their, their, own, their own selves. Well, anyhow, he died in December of 1941. There's some other information to consider. And consider. Um, in 1945, after the war, Maria Bernhardt, Oscar's second wife, had returned to Vomperberg settlement and started it all over again. She then had Oscar's writings republished as the final authorized edition. Today, there are two divisions of the movement with a long and drawn out controversy among the leadership of the organization. And as stated earlier in the presentation, um, there's about 10 to 40,000 um, participants of this group. Um, if it's 10,000, then yes, it's obviously, uh, in low numbers, 40,000 is a little higher, but it is still something to consider. Um, as we are talking about, uh, false prophets and, uh, and antichrists too. Okay. So here we're going to be talking about free Masonic symbolism now. Why am I doing this? Well, we've been talking about Abdrushin. We've been talking about influences uh, for his movement. And one of these influences um, that we can just easily see um, in, in images of him, not even considering his, his teachings, which there are many uh, in there, um, parallels with Freemasonry and uh, Abdrushin, there's there's some symbols to consider, and uh, let's let's continue and, and look at some of these. So right here, look at how the eye is like the sun. It is ascending above Oscar here, and its beams of light are just like that of the Masonic symbol. Right. 
So the, the eye symbol there is oftentimes referred to as the eye of providence, right? You can, you know, obviously see it on the back of your dollar bill, which you got to ask yourself, how did that get there? Um, but, uh, but yeah, actually that's, that symbol, uh, is kind of like a demented kind of like gross symbol. Um, if you see a lot of, uh, masons, they're wearing aprons and they place that symbol kind of, a, a, in front of their, uh, their, their private parts. Um, this is because ultimately that is supposed to be what they may refer to as the generative principle. Um, it is a, uh, it is a phallic symbol, um, as masonry is very much about, uh, uh, kind of like, uh, fertility worship, um, going back to mystery religions, uh, such as, uh, Babylon. Um, but, uh, yeah, here's one example. And, uh, here's another example too. Um, here with, uh, the, uh, cover of his book, um, in light of the truth, I guess, um, it's one of his early publications and there you got the eye symbol, right? It's Masonic. Uh, here again, you see the eye symbol, but here again, you see it is connected with Oscar's book. So remember what, what Satan ultimately was tempting Eve with. It says, uh, and the serpent said unto woman, ye shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So when we go into actually reading the book, you'll see that some of these patterns actually continue um, within the teachings. Um, but yeah, once again, this connection with the eyes, right? Uh, your eyes can be open. Uh, you know, and you shall be as gods. Um, I decided I'd give uh, some examples. It's this one eye type of symbolism. Here you can see it also making its way into uh, Mormonism. Now, Mormonism was founded by uh, Masons. Uh, Joseph Smith was a Mason. Um, his brothers that were also involved were Masons. Brigham Young, you know, and uh, they, uh, and many of their, their temples uh, that they have, you know, whether they be in Utah or wherever, uh, often in, empl employ uh, symbols of, uh, of Masonry, in which the all-seeing eye is one of them. Um, obviously this isn't a, a study on Mormonism, but they even found their way into some of their writings as found in the Book of Mormon. Um, there's Satanist Aleister Crowley. He called himself the Beast 666. Um, and there it is right on his hat. Um, the guy was a Satanist. He claimed to murder children, you know, by his own record. And, uh, he was responsible for, uh, sex magic. Um, or at least you know, he was a practitioner of it, pervert, and, uh, he's, he's gone to hell. He, he worshiped Satan and, uh, he's reaped what he sowed. Um, so, you know, uh, call it a coincidence that the symbol is on his forehead. You know, he called himself the beast 666. And, uh, this is not only a prominent symbol of Freemasonry, but also Catholicism. Okay, uh, now we're going to be looking at pyramids, because here on the left, you actually have Abdrushin's tomb. Uh, that pyramid there uh, on the top left, that was his uh, symbol, and apparently um, he started his own publishing firm, and that's his logo right there. Um, you know, with the star at the top there, uh, it's a black star, you know, kind of... Uh, might have satanic connections, but, uh, you know, there you have the, um, the dollar bill symbol. Um, and then in that center there, um, or uh, bottom, bottom right, uh, you have the Masonic, uh, like square and compass, um, the square and compass. That's once again, a reference to, uh, fertility worship. Um, the square is supposed to represent the male principle and the, um, compass is supposed to represent the female principle and, um, yeah, that G, uh, genitive, uh, principle and, uh, actually, yeah, that, 
that I is supposed to be phallic. That is a phallic symbol. So very perverted, very evil. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Charles Taze Russell even has the same grave, right? There he is, uh, Charles Taze Russell, you know, founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, didn't believe that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, you know, his organization has been responsible for many evils, um, leading people to hell, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, actual, um, uh, cover-up, um, abuse, uh, sexual abuse as well. Um, I was uh, learning about that the other day. Um, very, very wicked, not a good man. And, um, another man who, who was not saved. Um, Charles Taze Russell was not a born-again Christian. Um, here's something that I was kind of discovering. Um, apparently, uh, the pyramid is also used in, uh, witchcraft, but um, masonry also calls itself the craft or the royal craft. Um, that is also in reference to witchcraft. Um, there's a pretty good video. It's about five hours long. It was by a guy named uh, Altian Childs. He was, uh, I think, the first X Factor winner. And a very good description. Um, very long, very drawn out, but very uh, thorough. And uh, if anybody is interested in watching that, um, yeah, you can uh, you can look it up online, and maybe uh, even provide I'll even provide a uh, link in the description. Okay, so this is the Ouroboros. Um, I decided I was uh, just going to uh, have the description from Wikipedia, just to explain my point. Um, there you can see there the square compass skull um all that hate me love death um that's what proverbs chapter 8 says but uh there you have a snake eating his own tail um serpents you know why why serpents we might ask um it's kind of giving me uh genesis chapter 3 uh flashbacks uh garden of eden you know but um let's let's read uh let's read this uh passage here or sorry, this uh, this reference here, uh, where it says uh, the Ouroboros or Euroboros is an ancient sim symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. The Ouroboros entered Western tradition via ancient Egyptian iconography and the Greek magical tradition. Um, it was adopted as a symbol in Gnosticism and Hermeticism, and most notably, alchemy. So there you have that Gnostic connection. And ultimately, yes, there is a connection with Gnosticism and Freemasonry. The Ouroboros is often interpreted as a symbol for eternal cyclic renewal or a cycle of life, death, and rebirth. The snake's skin slothing symbolizes transmigration of souls. The snake biting its own tail is a fertility symbol in some religions. The tail is a phallic symbol, and the mouth is a yonic or womb-like symbol. So very perverted, very disgusting, and yet here you go. This is even found on things like Wikipedia, right? You don't need to turn to morals and dogma by Albert Pike, you know, or Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. It's like, this is Wikipedia. This stuff is out in the open, you know, and, and I think that's that's kind of intentional. It's kind of like uh, an eyes wide shut type of thing where it's like, if you're just not looking for it, you won't notice it. But it's like, if you know that stuff is out there, it's like, you're going to see it. And it's it's confirmed by by even things like Wikipedia. So... Um, this is the Knights Templar Cross, which is devoted to the 32nd degree of Freemasonry. The Masons claim that their origins come from the Templars that were disbanded for their worship of Baphomet. And there you go, right in that left corner, uh, Abrushin Grail Message Foundation, um, has that same symbol. Um, all right, here, we're going to kind of show back to back i'm going to be expanding the images uh 
pretty big just to make the point. But yeah, even even here, it's like uh, it's pretty clear to see that Abrushin's taking influence straight out of Freemasonry, even down to the black and white duality with the two people by his side, and them and then him wearing black and white to show that he is the union of opposites, which is very much an occult doctrine. Um, for those that may not know. Uh, they kind of see things all in balance, right? Like white and black, good and evil, male and female, uh, light and darkness. Um, that's that's an occult uh, doctrine. Um, and a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord, right? Obviously, you know, God created all things and he is good, right? God is is love, you know, and and cannot lie. Um, Satan is the father of lies, and uh, he he's the one that uh, is is the not uh, he he leads people astray. Um, it's it's obviously uh, there there is conflict, but Satan Satan would love to be considered equals with God. Satan said, it's like, uh, I will be like the most high, right? In Isaiah 14. Um, but Satan will be cast down, uh, to hell, to the sides of the pit as, as demonstrated in that passage. Um, let's, let's continue and look at, uh, some of these things a little bit closer. Um, so here you have kind of like an out, uh, outlook on, uh, the, uh, Masonic, uh, symbols um you can see a lot of like depictions and stuff like that but there you have these uh you know the sun and the moon um you have uh these pillars um the black and white temple the square and compass uh the square and compass is intentionally placed over the king james bible um because like uh the square and compass they in the lodges they view the bible as nothing more than symbolic and not a place where, obviously, you're supposed to be finding real truth. Because in Masonry, anybody can join as long as they believe in a higher power. Um, that means that uh, Christians, Catholics, uh, Muslims, you name it, um, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, all these people can come together. But that goes against what the Bible says where he calls us to be separate right? Not to be, you know, yoked together with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, you know? Be not unequally yoked, because what ha fellowship hath Christ with Belial, you know? What what fellowship hath light with darkness, right? So it's obviously against the Bible, um, and uh, yeah, it, it, calls, it calls evil good, uh, or at least on par, um, as almost uh, mere dynamic forces of each other, but not one is greater than the other. The pillars on the side also are to be uh, representative of the Temple of Solomon. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, Solomon had uh, the temple built, um, and uh, that's what they claim to have their inspiration by. Uh, their opening uh, ceremony is based off of... Uh, an extra biblical traditional story, which is not in the Bible, so then put it into con into question. Um, this man was basically killed during the construction of the temple, but once again, false story. It it's not found in the Bible. I thought I would bring this up. This is actually a tarot card, and here you have the same pillars um, standing side by side. You've got the white and black. Right, uh, that's supposed to be uh, Boaz and Jekin, and there you have uh, the high priestess. Um, that's uh, what the card is. It's actually supposed to be a papal figure. Apparently, there was a woman pope at one point. She ascended the ranks, deceived everybody, and um, yeah, no, it's um, it's kind of weird. These patterns are emerging even in things like tarot cards, where divination. Uh, and uh, summoning uh, familiar spirits are involved. Um, finally, here's a picture of 
yours truly, Abdur Shin, uh, standing in the middle. And look who's standing beside him. You've got, uh, who cares what their names are? Um, you've got them at least wearing white and black, uh, standing at both sides of each other, uh, left and right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, that's the, the duality. Um, you have also uh, the eye symbolism behind him. Um, and then you've got like the sun and uh, the stars and uh, the Templar. And the, actually, uh, right there, that seems to be a sword. That kind of looks like something that the Shriners have. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just place an image on the screen here just to show you. Um, yeah, it's weird, weird stuff. Um, but you can... You can see uh, that there was obviously an influence um, that masonry had in um, Abdushin's uh, ceremonies and his rituals, um, which makes a person just question everything that he spoke about. Um, and the the plot here's the, here's the truth about Freemasonry is that it is Satanism. Um, whether it is Albert Pike or, uh, Manly P. Hall, they, their, their highest teachings do show that it is in the end, um, when you've achieved the ranks, it is, uh, Satanism. It does, they do work, uh, it is a, a cult that is devoted towards worshiping Satan. And, uh, yeah, it's very, very dark and evil, evil stuff. And I would encourage people to to look into this uh, a bit further but don't let your your lying eyes deceive you um obviously abdrushin was involved um or at least heavily influenced by masonry and uh if he wasn't in it he definitely um used it he definitely was influenced by it i thought i would add just this last section just to help demonstrate the point uh, that Freemasonry, ultimately, uh, the secret religion uh, that exists within it, is actually uh, Satanism. Um, here I have some quotes from some of the most influential uh, Freemasons um, throughout, uh, throughout history. Um, here you have uh, Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, which is considered like the you know, Mason's uh, handbook. Um, I believe every Mason receives a copy. And, um, yeah, it's uh, it says, Faith which uh, aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps of and works of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light, and with its splendor intolerable, intolerable blinds fe feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revel uh, revelations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of one age, nor of one creed. Okay, so that's one quote. Um, I'm not going to read all of them. But uh, here's um, one that uh, you can turn to. It's in the Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. It says, When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands and before he may stop, step to, onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply his, this energy. So once again, just proving ultimately that, yes, Freemasonry is, is Satan worship. It is Luciferianism. Um, it is the occult. It is not the craft. It is magic. Um... And this is not just me saying this. This is well documented. Um, it is a historical fact. So I thought I would add this part here.
Lucifer, what is your problem? Just that, sir. Okay. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about it about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. No. And you're, hey, what you're about confirming those hospitals? It. They, you know, they, they you know what, sir? <clears throat> Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So you're a Christian and you don't know that. Actually. No, I really am. You are. Because that, I'm pure and virtuous. You're pure and virtuous. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're perfect without Jesus, right? No, no, no. No. Okay. Tell me about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh. Well, he's, he's my leader. Is he the son of God? Yes, he is. Is he the only worshipful master? Yes. Have you ever been called worshipful master? No, because I, I've just been too busy. I've been working. Working. Been working to help people. What like kind you. of work? Okay. Get out of here. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. Have you heard it? So here are some closing thoughts uh, that I would add. Um, after Shin's legacy is that of many false prophets and cults. Uh, failure. His prediction on the end of the world before the time, as the day and hour no man knoweth, Matthew 24, verse 36, uh, just places him as yet another failed prophet. His parallels to other cults in his time and Freemasonry shows that he was not as creative as he would like people to think, as he even expressed himself. As we continue to look at more of his teachings, as found in the light of the truth, we can start to recognize the similar teachings found in many cults, and can see where it comes from when we turn to the Holy Bible. Okay, so this is part two on uh, exposing uh, the false light of Abdru Shin. Um, in this segment, we're going to be looking at uh, the lectures um, of, of this man and uh, the teachings of the Grail Message Foundation. Um, let's start off with a verse of scripture. It says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So here are the three lectures uh, that we'll be looking at today. Uh, there are multiple lectures um, that were written by Oscar E. Bernhardt. Um, in the pamphlet that I got, the uh, booklet that I got, um, there was different ones than the ones that you can find a PDF for on uh, online. I'll be leaving a link to the PDF in the description um, and uh, you can proceed from there. Uh, there was other things that I wish I could talk about, but for the sake of time, I decided to limit it to uh, these three. And uh, there's going to be a lot of important information uh, to read here. Um, you definitely won't be missing out on uh, on some of the, the really bad stuff. So uh, let's let's just continue. So lecture one for your guidance. So, I'll be reading uh, primarily the bolded uh, sections. I don't want to be reading everything. Um, I'm addressing earnest seekers only. They must be able and willing to examine this objective matter objectively. Religious fanatics and irresponsible enthusiasts may hold aloof, for they are detrimental to the truth. As for the ma malevolent and non-objective they shall find their sentence in the very words. So he's only looking for gullible victims. Right? He doesn't want people to criticize what he has to say because he realizes he's saying a lot of malarkey. Um, 
Matthew 15, verse 14 says, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. Uh, how fitting uh, for the Grail Message Foundation. So, the following word does not bring a new religion, but is intended as the torch to help all serious listeners or readers find the right path which leads them to the lawn for height. Um, I'm just going to stop there for a moment. Look how he capitalizes word. Uh, that is the name of God. And yet he's referring to this as his writings. Um, this is wrong. Um, and, and it's subtle. It's very subtle. So he claims not to be starting a religion, then tries to start a religion. Once again only looking for gullible suckers. Only he who bestirs himself can advance spiritually. The fool who uses extraneous aids for this, in the form of ready-made opinions of others, walks his path only as if on crutches, while ignoring his own healthy limbs. So, by ready-made opinions... Um, he might just be referring to the Bible, um, which is interesting because I never even heard about this before, maybe a month ago. And uh, whatever things I may have read about uh, this outside of um, uh, Bernhardt's writings were things like articles. I didn't find a single YouTube video saying anything bad about about this. Um and quite frankly, when I started reading it, I started to recognize right away this was there was something wrong, um, especially when bringing it into comparison to what the Bible says. So, what about the Bible to discern what is true and what is not true? Instead of taking everything this guy says, let's test him out. 1 John 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Um, a general point uh, to make, um, at the second last paragraph, he sounds like he's encouraging the reader to examine the evidence and be crucial. But as we continue, he's going to say a lot exactly the opposite. Okay, so this is lecture two, and this one is called, What Seek Ye? So... What seek ye? What is all this tumult tumultuous agitation? It permeates the world like a fer ferment, and a flood of books overwhelm all peoples. <clears throat> Scholars pore over ancient writings, investigating and pondering until spiritually exhausted. Prophets arise to warn, to predict. Suddenly, from all sides, people strive fervor fervorously to spread new light. Thus it rages, now over the troubled soul of mankind, not refreshing or invigorating, but scorching, consuming, absorbing the last vestiges of strength still left to the afflicted one in this gloominess of the present time. By flood of books, would he also be talking about his own? He published his own book. Is he self-aware? Or is he talking about a particular 66 books found in one volume, otherwise known as the Bible, i.e. King James Bible for the English-speaking language? We'll get into that here he shows how desperate people are for a new revelation, and then people are left tense and on edge because of it. He continues these points in the next paragraph. Unfortunately for Bernhardt, this is precisely what him and his grail message does. As he prophesies and claims to bring new revelation, which ends up falling flat on his face. Um, Deuteronomy 18 verses 19 to 22 uh, talks about false prophets like Abdrushin, where it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. 
But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Right? So, according to the Bible, according to the Old Testament, if we were still going under Old Testament law, Abdushin, a.k.a. Oscar E. Bernhardt, would be killed. There would just be no questions about it. He would be put to death um, because he's a false prophet. Um, so, uh, in the next section, um, he, uh, basically talks about how people get worked up from religion, and he makes his own religion, um, and let's just continue, uh, on with what he was saying, um, about, let's say, the, the people writing their books and the, uh, the prophets and whatnot. Um, they offer stones for bread, look at the innumerable book, innumerable books, Okay, there we go again. They do not animate. They only weary the human spirit. And this is the proof of the barrenness of all they offer. For whatsoever weariness the spirit is never right. Spiritual bread immediately refreshes. Truth revitalizes and life light animates. Okay, so I have an honest question. Has this guy ever heard about the King James Bible? Uh, people used to get killed willingly for the Bible, and people are still getting killed for it today. Uh, those words do animate. Um, Luke 4, verse 4, uh, and these passages are all about Jesus' words. It says, uh, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Right? Forget about, you know, whatever mumbo-jumbo uh, Abdur Shin was talking about, um, the real thing that matters is the word of God. Um, and, and that's not talking about the fundamentals either. That's talking about the words. Okay. Uh, John 6 verse 63 says, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 17 verse 17 Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then 1 Peter 1 verse 23 to 25 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And that's not the upper, uppercase W word of God either. Uh, that's the lowercase W. Uh, for all that... For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Right? And just remember in uh, Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So there is an emphasis on the written word of God. It is written. Okay? So I'm not going to read this point here. Um, he starts making statements about how science, about science, and then he makes the point that you don't need to go to university to know about these things like the Godhead. We will be getting more into this as we keep reading. Um, I'll read the bolded section again. It says, uh, listen, you despondent ones, lift up your eyes, you who are seriously seeking. The way to the highest lies open to every human being. Proficiency in learning is not the gate to it. Did Christ Jesus, that great example on the true path to the light, <clears throat> choose his disciples among the learned Pharisees? Um, look at how he talks about Jesus in the 11th paragraph. Uh, saying about him that he was that great example on the true path to the light. Uh, that's very subtle. Um, 
John 1 verses 4 to 9 says, In him was life, Jesus, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. Right? What's the light? And the, dar- and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. So John is bearing witness of the light. What's the light? That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, being John, but was sent to bear witness of that light, being Jesus. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus was not leading us to the light, you know, uh, he was the very light. He was that light. Very subtle, but he does this in a couple of times in his book. Uh, so I'll read uh, his uh, section again. It says, thus turn away from all scientific knowledge. Leave it alone, for science being a product of the human brain is piecework and must remain piecework. Knowledge is what the brain cannot conceive, can conceive. Yet how very limited is the perceptive capacity of the brain, which remains firmly bound to space and time. Even eternity and the meaning of infinity cannot be grasped by the hum- by a human brain. But the brain stands silent before the incomprehensible power streaming through all that exists from which it derives its own activity the power which everyone intuitively perceives as a matter of course every day every hour every moment whose existence science too has always recognized whereas with the brain that is without with the knowledge and intellect one sees in vain to grasp and comprehend so inadequate is the activity of the of a brain the basis and instrument of science and this limitation naturally also affects what it produces hence all science science itself so for the next couple of paragraphs bernhardt bernhardt goes off on science even going as far as to say turn away from all scientific knowledge uh what um, I wouldn't go that far, um, and neither does the Bible. Um, 1 Timothy 6 verse 20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Right? So we're supposed to avoid profane and vain ba- babblings and oppositions of science fa- falsely so called. Right? That's not saying you know, just completely scrap science altogether, right? Um, It's science falsely so-called for a reason. It means it's not true. It's not based on real science, right? Um, On the part concerning the brain, uh, tell me something. Why did God make a brain then? How did Bernhardt come up with such an interesting doctrine to begin with? Unless he didn't use his brain to come up with this, in which that wouldn't surprise me. Um, it's stuff like this where people like Bernhardt will say something that sounds very mysterious and profound. But what he is really telling you to do is get worked up with your emotions and not to really question what he's saying. This might be what someone thinks about being open-minded, you know, when it comes to being open-minded... But the truth of the matter is, if you let your mind be too open, you might just lose it. I'm going to just skip over this reading, and I'll just present it in the main slide. So here, after he tells us to turn away from all scientific knowledge and not to use our brain, he tells us to become like children. Oh, brother. He tries to say this about purity, but then says, this requires neither books <clears throat> nor spiritual strain, neither asceticism nor solitude. He will become sound in body and soul, freed from all pressure of morbid pondering, 
for all exaggeration, is harmful. Uh, then I guess I can drop this book and stop reading it. By this book, I mean Bernhardt's book. See how this is so hypocritical? The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, which is completely devoted to God's word where it says, and here is multiple verses here, um, verses 7 to 48 says, And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Uh, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 96 to 98 says, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandments is exceeding broad. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. The, though through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Uh, verse uh, 109 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Verse 127 says, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Verse 151 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Right? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And verse 172 says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Right? Um, This is the book that he's saying, you know, this is neither required of books. Why does he hate books so much? For an author, you know, that seems to write a lot, he seems to hate books and just wants you to kind of like, you know, get into a trance and, and kind of like uh, learn about the universe through osmosis. Uh, we haven't even gotten started with this guy yet. Um, let's continue. Okay, so I'm not going to read this slide here. Um, I'm just going to read it in the next slide. Um, so he ends up saying, Heed not the dissensions of the churches, the great bringer of truth, Christ Jesus, the pers personification of divine love, did not concern himself with creeds. After all, what are the creeds today? Okay, which once again, look at the subtlety of this guy. He never calls Jesus God manifest in the flesh, and he just calls him bringer of truth. Uh, he is the truth. He then takes a bit of truth by referencing creeds from church tradition, which Jesus spoke openly against. But remember what he said earlier when he told us to become like children. This requires neither books nor spiritual strain, neither asceticism nor solitude. He also said, look at the innumerable books. They do not animate. They only weary the human spirit. Where is the Bible in all of this? Did he forget to ever mention it? Or does he not want you to know what the Bible actually says? Final point to make, he says at the end, Therefore, awake, shatter the walls of dogma within you, tear off the bandage, so the pure light of the highest may reach you, undimmed. Essentially, ye shall not surely die, in reference to the serpent in the garden, getting Eve to deny the words of God. Take into consideration what Jesus actually said. Matthew 7, verse 24 to 25. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came. And the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. 
So this is what Jesus is saying about his words. If you want yourself to stand up, if you want yourself to be on solid ground, you have to go based on the words of God. Okay, this is the last lecture, and it's called Awake. And while this is going to be one of the longer ones, I'm going to try to speed things up so that therefore we can get through this a little bit faster. But really, this is going to be the most intense one. Um, this had the most issues, and it's, it's bad. So uh, let's get started. So he says, Consider, what applies to one does not apply to all. What helps one person may harm the other. Each individual must make his own way to perfection. The abilities he carries within him are his equipment for this. He must adjust himself to them and build upon them. Otherwise, he will remain a stranger to his real self. Will always stand by beside what he has learned which can never come to life in him. Thus he is barred from any gain. He will vegetate, all progress being impossible. Okay. I like this part where he says what applies to one does not apply to all. Um, I'm going to need a chapter and verse on that. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one uh, verse that talks about uh, one, um, quotations one. It's uh, Romans uh, 3, verse 10 to 12. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. One. So how is that for what applies to one, right? And it does apply to all. Um, Proverbs 11 verse 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So God's not going to be judging one person differently than the other person and then one other person differently than the other. Um, Yeah, once again in Proverbs it says, uh, Diverse weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. Here's an additional point that I want to make as well. Um, take into consideration how he is always capitalizing the words light and truth. Um, he also does the same thing with word as well. These are the names of Jesus, and he's turning it into terms for his own teachings. Uh, that breeds confusion and there is something twisted about that. There's something not right. Uh, very important to consider. Okay, so here I'm going to do a little bit more reading than what I'd like to be doing. Like, kind of like uh, allow him to explain himself a little bit more. And then to just really show uh, a lot of the hypocrisy um, in his statement. So, um... Let's begin. Uh, does he not yet know that it is related to the capacity of the, his brain, which is bound to time and space, that because of this he cannot recognize with his eyes anything rising above time and space? Has this logical, intellectual reasoning not yet become clear to any of these scoffers? Spiritual life, let us also call it the beyond, is, after all, merely something that stands completely above the earthly division of time and space, and therefore requires a similar nature in order to be recognized. Yet our eyes do not even see all that can be classified within time and space. Think of a drop of water, which appears immaculately pure to every eye, and which on examination under the microscope is shown to contain millions of living organisms mercilessly fighting and destroying each other. Are there not sometimes bacteria in both water and air that can have the power to destroy human bodies? and that are imperceptible to the human eye. 
but they become visible by means of powerful instruments. Hmm. So he makes fun of those scoffers who are not spiritual, i.e. critics of his beliefs, and then just says they're not awake. Um, in this little section that we read here, uh, he goes from saying we cannot recognize so much in this world because our brains cannot comprehend them to see what man's invention is able to help us comprehend. Remember, like, five minutes ago in the previous lecture, he said, turn away from all scientific knowledge. And then he says, leave it alone, for science being a product of the human brain is piecework and must remain piecework. Um, you don't tell somebody to turn away from all scientific knowledge and then say, oh, well, look under a microscope and look at bacteria in a drop of water. Um... You're, you're talking about scientific things. Um, there's something very, very hypocritical about, about all this. James 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And, yeah, we can see that Mr. Abruchin is a little bit double-minded. Okay, so let's read the next section. What then is is the beyond. The word confuses many. The beyond is simply all that cannot be perceived by earthly means, and earthly means are the eyes, the brain, and all other parts of the body, also the instruments that help them to do their work still more accurately and precisely, and to extend its scope. Therefore, one could say the beyond embraces all that is beyond the perceptive capacity of our physical eyes. But there is no division between this world and the beyond. Hmm. Nor any gulf, all is united, as is the whole of creation. For this reason, change your attitude. There is no such thing as this world and the beyond, but only one united existence. The idea of a division has been invented solely by man, because he is unable to see everything, and imagines himself to be the center and focal point of the surroundings visible to him yet his sphere of action is greater with the erroneous idea of divisions however he forcibly limits himself hinders his progress and allows his imagination to run riot and conjure up grotesque pictures okay he comes up with this whole concept of the beyond as a means of distinction between this world and the world we cannot see and then says that there is no separation between the world and the beyond. So saying the beyond is more or less pointless. On that point, however, let's just try to follow along with what Abdushin, I think, is trying to say, um, being that, you know, we're supposed to go beyond this physical world and, and try to see something into the spiritual world. Although he claims that there is no distinction really between them anyhow. Uh, but, but let's just, let's continue with this thought for a moment. I could be thinking about somebody in the Bible, um, in particular some people in the Bible who were trying to go beyond. Um, that would be the Tower of Babel. Uh, Genesis 11 verse 4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build let us build us a, sit, a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Right? So here's Abdushin, and he's like, oh, it's like you have to go beyond. You have to go further. You can, you know, only go beyond. And it's like, where where can we hear this in the in the past? Um, it, 
God has has made uh, the bounds of our habitations. Okay, let's let's look at another passage, um, Isaiah fourteen. Um, where it says, uh, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For that thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Right. And it's all about, you know, your own personal journey, you know, to go beyond. Well, that was exactly what the serpent was uh, was telling Eve in the garden. Um, we haven't really gotten to that point yet in, in this study, uh, but I'm going to tell you right now it is going in that direction. Um, here, uh, let's read another passage uh, about the restrictions uh, that God has given us. Um it's in Ecclesiastes uh, 3, verse 11. It says, uh, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. He Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Which is, yes, God has made us limited um, because it's like he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing, Right? He has set us beneath him, right? And rightfully so. We are his creation. So an honest question is, what else is there to know about God and what he has established other than what God has placed in his book, i.e. the Bible? If you believe in Jesus and you believe we have his words and believe that he is God manifest in the flesh, all that you will ever need to know will be found right in that book. You don't need to keep searching. Everything's right there for you. If you want to go beyond God's word and be caught in your own craftiness, continue at your own risk. Go right ahead. Uh, perhaps ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes should be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right, as you continue look, to look beyond, I mean, it's it's not much of a stretch, and as we continue going further, it's it's going to become way more apparent. It was terrifying, actually. Is it surprising then, if as a consequence, many only smile incredulously? while others adopt an unwholesome form of worship that becomes servile or degenerates into fanaticism, who can then still be astonished if some people develop a nervous fear, even terror and consternation? Away with all this! Why these torments break down this barrier which human error sought to erect, but which never existed. Your past wrong attitude also gives you a false foundation on which you vainly endeavor continually to build up the true belief, that is, inner conviction. Hmm. Tell me something. These fanatics that Bernhardt is talking about, are they following the Bible? If you're own inner conviction is basically whatever you want to believe in is true in your own eyes. As demonstrated in his statements, what applies to one does not apply to all, and what helps one person may harm the other, and each individual must make his own way to perfection, then you are basically repeating the initial temptation as found with the serpent in the Garden, Garden of Eden. As we demonstrated within the last segment, Abdrushin was a Freemason, as demonstrated with his symbolism. And here we can see where his doctrines are coming from. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 to 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light 
It doesn't say darkness there. It says light. He's transformed into an angel of light. He's deceiving people. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And what are their works? Well, they are deceitful workers. So it's going to be in deception. See the deceitfulness of all of this. The pride, the arrogance, the moving beyond and finding your own personal truth. Can you see how satanic this is? He may not be calling out Satan directly, but he's repeating all the same points. This is very serious. I, I hope that whoever may be watching this, who may even be involved with uh, the, Gra the Grail Message uh, Foundation and Abdurshin's teachings, um, I hope that this is waking you up a little bit. An eternal law operates in the universe. That only in giving can one receive where lasting values are concerned. Like a sacred legacy of its creator, this law deeply permeates the whole of creation. To give unselfishly, to help where help is needed, and to understand both the suffering and the weakness of your fellow men, means to receive because it is the simple and true way to the highest. Try it, for your thoughts are the messengers you send forth, which return heavily laden with similar thought forms, good or evil, as the case may be. This actually happens. Remember that your thoughts are realities that shape themselves spiritually, often becoming forms outliving the earth life of your body, then much will become clear to you. So, taking care of your fellow man is just one of the things that Abrushin promotes. Well, if we look into Freemasonry, actually, uh, we can find a similar uh, sentiment. Um, here's a statement from Manly P. Hall, um, Lectures on Ancient uh, Philosophy, uh, Chapter 19. He says, Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. Before it is possible to intelligently discuss the origin of the craft, it is necessary to establish the existence of these two separate yet interdependent orders, the one visible and the other invisible. The visible society is a splendid camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoined to devote themselves to ethical, educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. The Invisible Society is a secret and most august fraternity whose members are dedicated to the service of a mysterious Arcanum, Arcanum which means mystery of mysteries. So, Satan is not stupid. He knows that if he is going to deceive someone, he is not going to run around and be like, Oh, I'm so evil. Let me just go around telling everyone how evil I am and only focus on causing pain and suffering to people. No, Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. And when John beholds Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 verse 6, he says, And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Um, Mystery Babylon... Um, the mother of harlots and abominations, uh, that's the, that's ultimately the Catholic Church. Um, and, and there's no other uh, system that could match the description as demonstrated in, in those two chapters in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, here, we see Satan is a one-trick pony. And it really is, yea, hath God said, 
and ye shall not surely die. Um, one thing to consider, um, just uh, in, in cutting that verse short, um, is, is the fact that we're say Christianity teaches, for by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? That's Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Um, a person's not saved by their good works, right? And throughout the entire Bible, um, it's demonstrated that God accepts uh, a sacrifice which is a uh, contrite and, and repented uh, spirit, right? Um, by grace through faith, um, you're, you're not going to get saved based on your works. Um, so... What would Satan be doing if he was going to try to produce a counterfeit religion in order to send people to hell and to avoid what is the true gospel? Um, he would be establishing a works-based system that is devoted towards a illusion of good, so that therefore people will focus on that rather than actually coming to know that their works are as filthy rags and their righteousness is, is nothing to what God has to offer, freely imputed to those who believe. And the Freemasons get themselves involved in all different types of charities, in all different types of hospitals, in, in all these other foundations. But it is Satanism. It is a deception. Please remember that. And and this is the same type of sentiment uh, that we're seeing here with Abdur Shin. Uh, hook, line, and singer. Exactly as predicted. Thus it is quite rightly said, for their works will pursue them. Thought creations are works which will one day await you. Keep the hearth of your thoughts pure. By doing so, you will bring peace and be happy. Do not forget that every thought you produce and send out attracts all similar thoughts on its way or attaches itself to others, thus continually increasing in strength and finally also reaching a goal. A human brain, which is perhaps off its guard just for a moment, thereby offering such floating thought forms the opportunity to penetrate and operate. Thus you stand in the world of thoughts, and according to your way of thinking, at the time make room for similar thought forms. Do not therefore waste the power of thinking, but gather it for defense and for keen thinking, which goes forth like spears and affects everything. Thus create out of your thoughts the holy spear which fights for, your, for the good, heals wounds, and furthers the whole of creation. I guess, for their works pursue them, is in reference to Revelation 14, verse 13, uh, where it says, And I heard the, a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and the works do follow them. So this is for they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus as demonstrated in the verse above. So I guess this proves once again, I can do all things with a verse out of context. Uh, group, you know, who's guilty of that? Uh, Mr. Abdur Shin. Um, Abdur Shin doesn't care if you keep Jesus's commandments. He never mentions Jesus's words unless he can twist them enough to then go on about his own whims. Uh, I would judge Bernhardt with the Bible, not the Bible with Bernhardt. Uh, now, basically everything that he said 
afterward is right out of the book The Secret from Rhonda Byrne. Uh, let me read the Wikipedia description. Uh, the Secret is a 2006 self-help book by Rhonda Byrne based, based on the earlier film of the same name. It is based on the belief of the pseudoscientific law of attraction, remember, which claims that thoughts can change a person's life directly. The book alleges energy as assurance of its effectiveness. Byrne reintroduces a notion originally popularized by such as Madame Blavatsky and Norman Vincent Peale. That thinking about certain things will make them appear in one's life. And obviously, uh, Madame Blavatsky, H.P. Uh, Blavatsky, was a huge uh, influence for people like Aleister Crowley and Adolf Hitler. Um, big time occultist. She even worshipped Satan, just like the Freemasons. And go figure, uh... Who's to say Bernd Hart didn't get his inspiration from her? Um, Bern provides examples of historical persons who have allegedly achieved this. Bern cites a three-step process, ask, believe, and receive. This is based on a quotations from the Bibles, Matthew 21, verse 22, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Okay, so Bern is quoting Bernhardt, and essentially Bernhardt is quoting H.P. Blavatsky. Uh, Matthew 21 verse 22 is for believers, not just anyone, contrary to what Rhonda Byrne might say. John 9 verse 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. So you might as well just go chuck the secret in the in the trash. Uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Uh, don't, too, don't hear too much of that with uh, these Satanists, i.e. Avrushin. Also, I need a chapter and verse on Holy Spear. Okay, let's continue. Adjust your thinking, therefore, towards activity and progress. To do this, you must shake many a pillar supporting traditional ideas. Um, okay. Uh, let us take, for, instant, for instance, the concept of time. Time passes, time changes. We hear this said everywhere, and automatically a picture arises in the spirit. We see changing times marching past us. Many then believe that in such places faith must act as a substitute for, failure, for the failure of logical reasoning. But this is wrong. Man should not believe in things he cannot grasp. Like the beyond, for example. Um, he must try to understand them, for otherwise he opens wide the doors to error. And with error, the truth is always debased. Time. Does it really pass? Why does one encounter obstacles when thinking more deeply about this axiom? Simply because the fundamental idea is wrong, for time stands still. We, however, hurry towards it. We rush into time, which is eternal, and seek the truth in it. Time stands still. It remains the same today, yesterday, and a thousand years hence. Only the t forms change. We plunge into time to call from her records for the purpose of enriching our knowledge from what is being collected here, there. 
For time has lost nothing. It has recorded all things. It has not changed because it is eternal. Okay. So, shake many a pillar supporting traditional ideas. Uh, this guy just wants you to join his cult and to drop the Bible. Uh, this guy is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So, after that statement, he gets into his pretentious ramble about time and how it's all an illusion and how nothing really changes in your life. Okay, so how can I apply this to my life? You can say it doesn't, but I used to be a baby with a diaper and parents that would spoon feed me. I am now an adult who works full time and pays taxes. And someday, I'll be an old man with aches and pains and probably a diaper again, not being able to do the things I used to do. So I think time is evident. Okay? Uh, if you don't want to call it time, that's your fault. Uh, but that's that's exactly what's going on. Time is moving forward. And uh, just to add, things are not getting better. Um, also, for that point about faith and failure of logical reasoning... Remember earlier how he was saying things like the brain cannot have us understand things beyond the physical world and yada yada yada? This guy just contradicted himself again. You can understand what God wants for you in your life with the Bible. You won't be able to understand what the Lord wants if this rambling fa apostate false prophet is the guy you have to listen to. The guy forgets what he writes down and contradicts himself left, left, right, and center. Okay, next next section. You seek the truth. What is truth? What you still feel to be truth today, you will recognize even tomorrow as error. In which, however, you will later again discover grains of the truth. Of truth. For the manifestations also change their forms. Thus your seeking continues, yet amid these changes you mature. Truth, however, remains always the same. It does not change, for it is eternal. In being eternal, it can never be clearly truly grasped by the earthly senses which are familiar only with the change of forms, therefore become spiritual, free from all earthly thought, and then you will possess the truth, and will stand in the truth, and will bathe in it, constantly surrounded by its pure light, for it will envelop you completely. As soon as you become spiritual, you will swim in it. So, right at the very beginning was a very good question. What is truth? Tell me, Abdrushin, what is truth? Pilate asked this and didn't wait to hear the answer as demonstrated in John 18, verse 38. The truth is Jesus Christ, who lived, was killed, and was resurrected for our justification. The wages of sin is death. That is how Christ paid the price for our sins on the cross. Bernhardt could have easily stated this when he's talking about the truth, but instead he ignores it. Why? Because Bernhardt is a servant of the devil and doesn't care if you go to hell. Uh, John 8 verse 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. The statement, truth, however, remains always the same. It does not change, for it is eternal. And being eternal, it can never be clearly and truly grasped by earthly senses, is hogwash when you hear what the scriptures say about truth. Romans 3 verse 4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. 
Psalm 119, verse 60 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But you won't hear any of that come from this guy. It is foolish to talk of reverses of fortune or of trials. Every conflict and every sorrow means progress. Men are thus offered the opportunity to dispel the shadows of former misdeeds, for not a single farthing can be remitted to the individual, because here also the cycle of eternal laws in the universe is inflexible. The creative Father will reveals himself in them, and thereby forgives us and dispels all darkness. So clearly and wisely is everything arranged that the minutest swerving from this would have to plunge the world into ruins. But what of the man who has very much to redeem from former times? Must he not then despair? Will he not tremble at the thought of the misdeeds he has done he has to atone for? As soon as he honestly wills, he can hope and gladly begin with it. Free from all worry, for a balance can be brought about by the countercurrent of the power of good volition, which, like other thought forms, can take forms takes life in the spiritual, forging a strong weapon capable of removing every dark burden, every weight, and leading the innermost self towards the light. Is he talking about forgiveness in relation to our salvation? When you read this section, it truly sounds as though he's saying if we have done bad deeds in the past, we essentially work it off. Essentially, working to remove sins from your past. If he is saying this, then we got some issues. One sin, and sin is against God, by the way, one sin cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, and one sin has the power to cast you out of God's presence into the lake of fire for the rest of eternity. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And if you want to earn your salvation by works, then you'll go to hell faster than a bullet, because the wages of sin is death. The funny thing is, too, you wouldn't have to have done it either. You wouldn't have had to have worked for your salvation. The Bible says that our righteousness is as like filthy rags. Let's read a passage from Romans 3, verse 21 to 28. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So, whatever laws Abdur Shin, Oscar E. Bernhardt, whatever he could be talking about, man is justified by faith without the works of the law. And this is according to the book that Bernhardt claims to be supporting him. This is probably why he tells you not to read books throughout his entire book. I mean, give me a break. Okay. It says, And to you, 
are such lenses capable through your volition of gathering these invisible power currents that reach you and sending them forth as a united force for good or evil to bring blessing or indeed destruction to mankind. Through this you can and should light a blazing fire in the souls of men, a fire f of enthusiasm for the good, for the noble, and for perfection. Okay, well, what is good? That would be a good place to start. Uh, it's not like we're really hearing too much of what actually is good. It's just kind of like, oh, well, do good. Or try to do good. It's like... This requires only a strength of volition, which in a certain sense makes man lord of creation and master of his own fate. Mm. It is man's own volition which brings him destruction or redemption, reward or retribution, with an ex inexorable certainty. In the first paragraph, he expresses that we should be charismatic leaders in people's lives. In what, might I ask? If it is your own goals and achievements, it could basically be anything. And is this all going based on your own will? Jesus was our example in his ministry. Let's look at what he showed us on how we should live. In Matthew 26, verse 42, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. We should always be focusing on God's will, not our own. What is good is getting the message of the gospel to the lost world, which is something that Bernhardt has failed to mention throughout his lectures. On the second paragraph, do I need to read Genesis 3 again? Do I need to read Isaiah 14? Should I have read Ezekiel 28? This guy is quoting Satan. Uh, this man literally said that man is lord o and master over creation and over his own fate. I really don't think I should continue any further. I think that this should be self-explanatory. Okay, this is the last section of this lecture. Um, these are the final paragraphs of, uh, of this chapter. And uh, this is going to be uh, hard-hitting. This is going to bring the point home, I'm, I'm very certain. So it says, Do not fear, then, that this knowledge will alienate you from the Creator, or weaken your present faith. On the contrary, the knowledge of these eternal laws, which you can put to use, makes the entire work of creation appear even more sublime to you. Its magnitude forces him who searches more deeply to his knees in veneration. Man will never wish for evil things. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, he will joyfully grasp at the best support that exists for him. Love. Love for the whole wonderful creation, and love for his neighbor, that he too may be led to the glory of this enjoyment, of this consciousness of power. So, do not fear then that this knowledge will alienate you from the Creator, or weaken your present faith. You cannot be serious! If you are not getting red flags right now about this, you're lost and you are on your way to hell. You need to repent because you will meet your creator and you will face his wrath forever and ever. It talks about uh, how, uh, you know, I am the good shepherd and the sheep hear my voice, you know. He that is not of me, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, 
uh, the sheep do not hear uh, that man's voice, right? They won't follow a false prophet. And this man, Oscar E. Bernhardt, was undoubtedly a false prophet. Um, about his uh, his statement about uh, you know man will never wish uh, for anything for evil things, um, as the sentiment is carried throughout uh, much of his writing. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Um, it says, uh, yeah, I mean, and and you think about men like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. Uh, Nero, Mao Zedong, um, you'd have to have a complete and utter ignorance of history or or just human nature, just people, mankind, to, to, compl- to accept a statement like that. Um, the Bible says as well, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. That's uh, that's something to remember, the fear of the Lord. Finally, he ends with quoting Aleister Crowley one last time. By paraphrasing, love is a law, love under will. Uh, that was a quote by, uh, by Crowley. That was his maxim. And by love... Uh, Crowley meant, I want blasphemy, I want murder, rape, revolution, anything, bad or good, but strong. Um, yeah, and if it's all based on what you think, if it's all based on what you feel, why not? Why not do what thy wilt, as, uh, as Crowley, uh, said, um, and Crowley, once again, yeah, he was a he was a Satanist. He uh, practiced uh, what you'd call sex magic. He worshipped Lucifer, and um, yeah, uh, he was a servant of the devil, just like uh, Bernhardt. Okay, closing statement. Abdurshin was a servant of the devil who died and went straight to hell. He was undoubtedly an occultist, and his doctrines and practices emulate that of Freemasonry. Those who are involved with the Grail movement are not only in a cult started by a false prophet, but are against the word of God. For those who are in and who care about meeting God one day and being accepted by him, uh, they need to repent and accept Jesus Christ as their exclusive Lord and Savior, and drop Oscar E. Bernhardt like a hot rock. Sincerely. And I'm saying this with all intensity, because this this is wrong. This is evil. This is totally against, against Scripture, against the Bible, um, against God's Word. And uh, if you want to get saved... Um, I'd recommend you listen to that as opposed to whatever this man says. Uh, I don't think that any Christian with a pulse uh, could go through this and not be saying the things that I'm saying. And uh, yeah, it's it's time to get out of it if you are in this. Okay. So Matthew 7, verse 13 to 15. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And that marks the end of this two-part series um, exposing the false light of Abdru Shin. I hope that uh, this series has been edifying to to those that uh, 
to those that may need to respond to people involved in this movement to to be somewhat educated on what these people and i.e. Uh, Grail Message Foundation, uh, what what they teach. Um, this is obviously something where the people who are caught up in this, the people who are just just following with what they're being taught, um, these are people that should be empathized with, uh, should be uh, sympathized and um, reached out to with love and uh in sincerity um not obviously not hatred um obviously with with compassion with grace um and uh and praying that they they may come to the light that is god's word so to to end off this this series i'm gonna end it with a word of prayer and, uh, dear Father, dear Lord, I pray that this message will be able to reach those who have not accepted your message, your word, the, the true gospel, which you have given to us which you paid for with your blood so that whoever shall believe in you shall not perish but have everlasting life. And dear Father, please, please help whoever may be involved in this. Please help them escape the darkness that that is with this. Escape that darkness the false light of this movement and uh, bring them into your light, dear Father, because that is the true light. That is the true light. Thank you, dear Father, for, for all that you do. And uh, all this is prayed in your holy name, dear Jesus. Amen.